Dear friends, welcome back to the Community Presbyterian Church of Pismo Beach, California. I am your pastor, Bob Crouch. I am in the fellowship hall of the church recording this YouTube video because uh, I thought we thought it might, uh, the Wi-Fi might work a little better and the sound may be a little clearer. So we'll see, we'll give it a try. I'm here in the fellowship hall, as I said, and I bid all of you welcome on this beautiful, beautiful summer day. Uh, the first thing I'd like to do today is to light the peace candle. And to do the peace candle, to light that, uh, to accompany that, I have a wonderful quote from the late Father Henry Nouwen, one of my favorite spiritual writers from the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, Father Nouwen wrote, wrote these words, and I thought they're just so meaningful for all of us. He says, each day holds a surprise, but only if we expect it can we see, hear, or feel it when it comes to us. Let's not be afraid to receive each day's surprise. Whether it comes to us as sorrow or as joy, it will open a new place in our hearts, a place where we can welcome new friends and celebrate more fully our shared humanity. Amen. Thanks be to God for Father Henry now and those wonderful words about embracing the surprise that each day has for us. For God travels with us amidst the journey daily and is always bringing new things into our vision and to our hearts. I light the peace candle now. And it will be burning beside me and you won't be able to see it, but you will feel its glow. Okay, my friends, now I would like to share with you the scripture lesson for today. I'll be reading from the epistle of James, uh, reading at chapter two, verses 14 to 26. Let us listen together for the word of God. James writes, what does, it, what does it profit, my brothers and sisters, if a person says he has faith but has not works? Can his faith save him? If a brother or sister is ill-clad and in lack of daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body. What does it profit? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. Someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I by my works will show you my faith. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish fellow, that faith apart from works is barren? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered his son Isaac upon the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by works. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way, was not also Rahab the harlot justified by works when she received the messengers or spies and sent them out another way? For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so faith apart from works is dead. Here ends our reading for this morning, challenging reading. Thanks be to God. Years ago during a summer vacation, I read a book which really inspired me entitled Wisdom of the Ages. The book is a collection of the spiritual and philosophical insights of 60 women and men whose words have blessed and inspired millions of people down through the ages. Included in the book are great thinkers and teachers, such as Walt Whitman, Shakespeare, Buddha, 
Mahatma Gandhi, Emily Dickinson, Michelangelo, Jesus of Nazareth, and many more. As I reflected this past week on the scripture lesson we heard this morning from the epistle or letter of James, I immediately thought of one of the persons whom Dyer included in his book, a person many consider the finest American poet of the 19th century, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. And to be specific, I thought of the poem by Longfellow, which Dyer quoted in his book, A Psalm of Life. That's P-S-A-L-M, A Psalm of Life. Within the epistle of James admonition, for all of us to remember that true faith will always result in good and righteous works, let me share with you a brief portion of Longfellow's poem. For Longfellow and James, though they lived centuries apart, shared a common passion to teach human beings how to live with an enthusiastic, outward-reaching faith, a dynamic faith which would increase the presence of divine love in the world. Longfellow writes, Tell me not in mournful numbers, life is but an empty dream. For the soul is dead that slumbers, and things are not what they seem. Life is real, life is earnest, and the grave is not its goal. Dust thou art to dust returneth was not spoken of the soul. Not enjoyment and not sorrow is our destined end or way, but to act that each tomorrow finds us farther than today. In the world's broad field of battle, in the bivouac of life, be not like drum-driven cattle, be a hero in the strife. My friends, both James and Longfellow want us to see that genuine faith is revealed in those who find the courage and compassion to act, who find the ability to reach out to their fellow human beings. Indeed, Christian faith, says James rather bluntly throughout his controversial epistle, which by the way, the great church reformer of the 16th century, Martin Luther despised and wanted to ban from the Bible. Faith, said James, is about putting words, putting faith into action. I'll talk about why Luther felt so negatively about the letter of James in a few minutes. True faith, said James, is not primarily the possession of theologians, pastors, and scholars. It's not something that belongs primarily to the realm of the mind. True faith, James felt, is a matter of action, of works. It is found amidst humanity when there are great deeds of love and compassion present. It is seen in the ordinary person in the street who, filled with the Spirit of God, has an extraordinary enthusiasm and courage to, in a world of strife, be a hero, be a friend. A person of mature faith, says James, receives the Spirit of Christ into his or her heart and then acts boldly in the world, as Jesus did. In our scripture lesson this morning, from his New Testament epistle, James gives two examples of people who he feels displayed true faith. The Jewish patriarch Abraham, an intriguing woman named Rahab. In James' view, Abraham's faith was revealed in the deed of offering his son as a sacrifice to the Lord, which thankfully he did not have to carry out. The point of this story in the book of Genesis is that Abraham was willing to trust God and do whatever he felt God called him to do, even the unthinkable of giving up his beloved son. Concerning the intriguing narrative of Rahab, whose story is told in the Old Testament book of Joshua, a biblical scholar said this, Rahab, a prostitute of the Canaanite city of Jericho, is remembered for helping the Israelites defeat the pagan city of Jericho and for her place in the lineage of Jesus Christ. Yes, this woman 
was part of Jesus' family tree. Rahab's story begins during the invasion of the city of Jericho by the Israelites. Jericho, as I said, was a large Canaanite fortress city, and it was directly in the path of the Israelites, God's chosen people, who had just crossed the River Jordan. Before proceeding into battle, Joshua sends two messengers, or spies, into Jericho. The king of Jericho heard two Israelite spies were in the city, and so he sent troops to search for them. Although Jericho was a fortress, the less fortunate people lived outside its walls. Rahab and her family were poor and ran a tavern right outside of Jericho's walls. And actually their home was built into the wall. Rahab was known to be a prostitute and many men visited the tavern. One evening, two strangers came into her establishment. Right away, Rahab knew something was up. Rahab was a smart woman, shrewd, and she realized these were no ordinary men, they were spies. She realized there would probably, probably be an attack on Jericho and she would have to take action immediately to survive. She told the spies how the citizens of Jericho had been fearful of the Israelites ever since the Egyptians were defeated in the Red Sea saga. Rahab agreed to help the spies escape if she and her family were spared in the upcoming battle. Rahab hid the two spies on the flat roof of her house under large bundles of flax. When the soldiers arrived to look for the spies, Rahab lied and told them they were not there. The soldiers searched the tavern, but Rahab had hidden the spies well. The Jewish messengers or spies agreed to protect Rahab and her family, but explained that she must hang a scarlet robe out of the window so the Israelites would know which home to spare. The Israelites crossed the Jordan into Canaan and attacked the city of Jericho. The city was destroyed with only Rahab and her family spared. Ultimately, Rahab married a man named Solomon, an Israelite from the tribe of Judah. Rahab's son was named Boaz, the husband of Ruth. Joseph, father of Jesus, is thus Rahab's descendant. Somewhere I read, the Lord works in mysterious ways. Friends, Abraham and Rahab put their faith into action, though with very different motivations. Abraham acted out of obedience, Rahab out of a desire to protect her family. Yet both were used as instruments of God's will and power in the world. They both found the courage to do what they believed needed to be done. We heard James say that a faith without works one where there is a lot of talk about love for God, but where no action is done in God's name is a dead faith. Sadly, we see such faith today in Christians who profess love for God, yet have no compassion or concern for refugees, or for black people who have endured institutional racism for generations. We see dead faith, in Christians who say they love God, yet ignore the way our toxic lifestyles are slowly destroying the planet Earth, which God created and called good. Now let's explore for a moment why the great reformer Martin Luther was so critical of James. I think it's because he misunderstood him. Luther thought James was contradicting the Apostle Paul's central teaching that humanity is saved by grace and not by works, which by the way, was a key teaching of the 16th century Protestant Reformation that Luther and John Calvin risked their own lives to share. But the great church leader Luther read the epistle of James and seems to have got it wrong. I believe what James was trying to say with his emphasis on deeds was that true faith always bears fruit. Luther is right 
we are saved by grace, not by our good deeds. But James is correct as well in that good deeds are the hallmark of true faith. Friends, you and I are called to embrace such faith, to enthusiastically walk our talk of God's love and compassion amidst humanity. In other words, to practice what we preach, to practice what we proclaim in faith. When we do this, when we put our faith into action, then we make the name Jesus, not just the special and sacred memory of a hero in the past, Christ becomes a real and living hero in the present, a spiritual presence which heals, empowers, and transformed and is revealed, is revealed through our very words and deeds. Christ is revealed in your deeds and my deeds. The grace of God enables ordinary people to do extraordinary things. It enables the church to be the body of Christ in the world. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow yearned that all people would realize life is short, but the road is long. Thus he urged humanity to act, saying, be earnest, embrace today with enthusiasm, be the light wherever you encounter darkness. Now, I read this past week about a retired Presbyterian couple in Stockton, California, Cheryl and Douglas Hunt, who, to use Longfellow's words, embrace each day with enthusiasm, are earnest in nature, and strive to reflect God's healing light wherever they encounter darkness in the world. And that's one thing that Christians have in common. We don't run away or shirk from darkness we seek darkness so we can bring Christ's light there. Sometimes it's the darkness of sorrow. Sometimes it's the darkness of loneliness or illness or some other challenge. We don't move away. We move toward that darkness with Christ's light. In just a few weeks, on Wednesday, September 1st, Presbyterian Peace Fellowship will gather in a global online celebration to honor retired educators and Presbyterians, Cheryl and Douglas Hunt, with the Barstow Driver Award. Get this, an award for excellence in nonviolent direct action in retirement. I love that. Founded in 1944, Presbyterian Peace Fellowship is a nationwide community of Presbyterians who work to multiply and nurture Presbyterian peacemaking advocates and activists, young and old. Since 2014, the Peace Fellowship has honored Presbyterians in their retirement years who act on the nonviolence of Jesus Christ. Longtime members of First Presbyterian Church of Stockton, California, the Hunts City was the site of an early mass school shooting. In January of 1989, a gunman with an automatic assault rifle murdered five Asian American students and wounded 32 others, including a teacher at Cleveland Elementary School in the Hunts neighborhood. The Hunts have been involved ever since that tragic day in advocating against gun violence. Cheryl has developed a workshop on gun violence prevention for use by local Presbyterian women's groups. In 2018, the Hunts traveled to St. Louis to testify on gun violence prevention at the 223rd Assembly of the Presbyterian Church USA, the General Assembly, our denomination's uh, biannual meeting. In their service on the Peace Fellowships, Gun Violence Prevention Working Group, the Hunts are currently helping to launch the Guns to Gardens Project. I love this. This project organizes local congregations to host safe surrender events for people in their communities who want to decrease the number of guns in their homes and neighborhoods. 
The unwanted guns, listen to this. The unwanted guns are disarmed with a chop saw and forged into garden tools. Such a project reminds me of Isaiah's words, they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Reflecting on the Barstow Driver Award, the hunt stressed the importance of the relationships built when walking with other people as Jesus did. Through their work on the issue of gun violence, they found partners who have become cherished friends. A great gift for the hunts is that their sons have committed to sustain their projects. When asked why they are investing so much time and treasure during retirement on these challenging experiences, Doug said, we want our grandchildren and our children to thrive in a more peace-filled world. Friends, reminded by retirees Sherilyn Douglas Hunt of how people young and old can put their faith into action, faith into works in countless and creative ways. And just one way in this church is Linda Busick's Repair Cafe, that wonderful project which says, you know what? The earth is too polluted. We need to stop throwing things away and make them and utilize them and make their life last longer, to recycle them, to repair them. That's in the same um, passion that the Hunts bring to gun violence, Linda Busick, and many of you who participate in that project bring to ecological care. Care for the earth. With that all in mind, I close with the final words of Longfellow's poem, Lives of great men and women remind us we can make our lives sublime and departing leave behind footprints on the sands of time. Footprints that perhaps another sailing over life's solemn main, a forlorn and shipwrecked brother or sister seeing shall take heart again. Let, let us then be up and doing with the heart for any fate Still achieving, still pursuing, learn to labor and to wait. Friends, thanks be to God, for the grace of God enables us to put our faith into works, into deeds of compassion and mercy and love. Yes, my brothers and sisters, you and I, we have that wonderful calling and ability to leave, to leave footprints in the sands of time. Footprints which fill people, which our, which our grandchildren and children can follow and which lead to greater hope and justice in the world. Amen. pray with me. Dear God, thank you for the gift of this day, this beautiful summer day. 
Thank you for work to do and people to love. Thank you for enabling us to follow Christ, to leave footprints in the sands of time, to make a difference. Hear us now as we pray together, as Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you.